Hello everyone on this Wednesday, July 22nd. It's the fifth episode of the Deep Water MMA Podcast. I'm your host, Connor Rother, and I'm joined by my co-host, Lucas Grandside. What's up, Lucas? Hey, what's going on, man? Fifth episode. We keep it rolling, keep it coming. I mean, uh, five, five. I mean, we're starting to, uh, you know, rack up these shows. Yeah, I mean, it's good news, too, because with all these cards happening now, like our first weekend back since COVID that we have uh, Bellator and UFC the same weekend, so it actually feels like we're kind of like, we have, we definitely, there's no shortage of things to talk about. Plus, Titan FC is tomorrow night, too, which is kind of crazy that the regional shows are starting to come up, too. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's good to see MMA coming back a little bit to normal. You know, even booking these interviews, it feels normal again. Like, you can start looking outside UFC, start getting guys for Bellator. So, it's good to uh, good to see everything starting to come back to normal. Except for PFL, who, in the words of Daniel Cormier, needs to get their shit together. We're waiting for him, but <laughs> still, uh, still pretty good. Yeah. And, and for those watching too, like I mean, you you might notice that maybe we don't have a, a guest this week. We do. He's having a little trouble with internet and as far as weather goes. So uh, Dan Stuff of the Action Network is kind enough to join us. We had him on very briefly right before this, right when we were about to go live, and ended up not working. But uh, hopefully we can get him on. Uh, a lot of stuff to talk to Dan about. But while we wait for Dan, <laughs> and as we're moving along here, I mean, I think we had a, a real solid weekend of fights. And what's kind of crazy too is that. We're moving on to the last fight of the, I guess you want to call it the Fight Island July series, which like it seems like we waited so long for that, and now here there's only one fight left. Yeah, it, it kind of makes me sad. Like I feel like uh, you know there was so much talk of Fight Island now, Fight Island, Fight Island. Now it's like oh shit, Fight Island. Like yeah, no, it's, yeah. it's sad. It's the end of an era. All right, I think Dan is back in, so uh, let, let's see if we can bring him in here. That worked out perfect. <laughs> All right, there he is. What's going on, Dan? Hey, guys. Sorry about that. We're getting some really bad storms here and just knocked our power out, but I think we're back on. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, we, we actually were just like, all right, we'll just like stall for a little bit. And uh, <laughs> hopefully uh, there comes out. So it, it ended up paying off. Uh, I, and uh, I know you just got back from uh, the Appalachian Trail, too. Like, how, how was that? It's awesome. We actually, uh, there's a big stretch of it that's uh, just about 20 to 30 minutes away from here. Uh, so I'm trying to, to chip away and, and do different sections of it. But uh, that's definitely one of the benefits of living here in Virginia. We've got some really great hiking. Is that something like you've always done is like hiking or? No, I, I uh, it's probably been about four or five years. I, I lost almost 100 pounds just hiking. And, um, you know, there's not a whole lot of exercise that I like, but I enjoy walking around a bit. So yeah, um, it, it's an easy thing to do. And we've got so many awesome trails around here. Um, I really started uh, when I moved to Tennessee about six years ago. So um, no, it, it's it's great. And it's nice to unplug from the, the computer and the TV and, and get away from MMA uh, and everything for a while. And there's no better place to do that. Yeah, awesome. Are you a hiker, Lucas? I am. Luckily, I'm here at my uh, grandparents' house during quarantine. They have such a big property that I'm able to hike. And like Dan said, it's made me lose a lot of weight. And it's uh, it's very like uh, you do it without realizing. Like you start to get better at it. You go up and down the hills, things like that. No, it's it's uh, it's a good exercise for sure. I, we we could double this as a hiking podcast if we want. <laughs> <laughs> we got some experience here. <laughs> But uh, as we were talking right before uh, Dan joined us, you know, we're kind of uh, lucky this weekend. We got Bellator and UFC both back this weekend, especially in a time like this. Titan FC uh, tomorrow night seems like every night that you turn the TV on, there, there's a fight on. Uh, are, are you, anything you guys are kind of looking forward to uh, this weekend specifically? Let me start with you, Dan. Uh, I mean, obviously, the, the UFC headliner, uh, Whitaker Till, I mean, that's a, an awesome fight. Um, as someone who's covered MMA for a long time and kind of cut my teeth uh, watching events about 15, 20 years ago, uh, Shogun, Little Nog. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, they're past their prime and everything, but just kind of for nostalgia purposes, um, I, I, I'm interested in that one. Um, and the Bellator card doesn't really excite me too much. Um, I, I'm really kind of waiting for that Chandler or Michael Chandler, Benson Henderson fight. Mm -hmm. Um, but it'll just be nice to get any other MMA other than the UFC back. It'll just get us feeling a, a little more normal. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how I'm supposed to answer now. Like, uh, you know, Dan, Dan has the correct answer. It's obviously Whitaker's Hill, great fight. 
some sneaky good fights on the card. I mean, uh, Little Nog versus Shogun. I remember watching the second fight, and I, I don't know what I was expecting. I guess I thought we were going to get a replay of the first fight. <laughs> and the closest we got, I think it was like a really deep arm bar, if I'm remembering correctly. But, yeah, it, it's not quite the same. But there's some sneaky good fights, obviously, Verdum, Gustafson, things like that. Uh, yeah, Belts will hit the nail on the head. I mean, the main event is interesting, but not not too much because neither guy's going to get a title shot considering it's supposed to be Patrick Mix and Archuleta. So, but uh, still, still some interesting things, but obviously you can't beat Whitaker versus Till. That's for sure. Yeah. Now I'm glad you brought that Gustin too, because just like just taking any kind of uh, a guy of, like his caliber team, like bumping him up to heavyweight after the break he had, the retirement, you know, it's kind of, uh, that'll be interesting to watch. But uh, one thing I just want to say too, is I, I think I speak for Lucas and I too, when we say that I think we've been pretty blessed to have uh, a lot of great guests on the show so far. And especially for everyone who's kind of joined us along the way, uh, James Lynch, Mike Heck, Michael Staggs. We talked to a lot of different guys, Nolan King last week. Uh, now this week we're joined by uh, Dan Stump, you know, formerly MMA junkie, the athletic, and now uh, contributing for uh, Action Network. Uh, thanks for joining us, Dan. We we appreciate it. No problem. I, I really appreciate the the invite. It's always good to to talk to kind of the the next generation of journalists. There are so many of us, uh, kind of uh, the same group for the about five or ten years there, and it's amazing seeing all the talent pop up over the past five or so years. Yeah. And that's like one thing uh, I think we kind of want to talk about too, because I think when you talk about uh, the way journalism has, uh, I guess, been transforming over the years, I mean, especially now too, I mean, I think this is a very unique time with COVID and everything going on. But when the athletic was announced, there was just this like ex excitement around it, I feel like, uh, especially from uh, journalists and just the structure. And then they kind of brought this all-star team on. Can you just tell us a little bit about like what, what your experience was like uh, with the athletic? Yeah, I mean, just my biggest regret is obviously that it, it didn't work out. I thought we had uh, a really amazing team. I think we had a really good chemistry. Uh, I think as good as everybody was individually, especially guys, you know, Ben Folks and Sean and, and Chuck and all these guys, like, you know, they're already at the top of their game. But I think us working together, it, it really kind of made everybody just that much better. Um, obviously, the the pandemic kind of uh, ruined the the plans we had there, and I mean it's a byproduct. I, I think I've I've worked in sports and, and journalism long enough. Like I understand that MMA is not for everybody. It's a small niche sport, even among small niche sports. Um, so we're always going to be kind of low man on the totem pole, and and you know when it comes to to layoffs or, or trimming budgets and stuff. Obviously, MMA. Uh, you know, golf, NASCAR, boxing, kind of those non-major sports are, are always going to kind of be probably on the cutting room floor. Um, but it's unfortunate. Like, you know, I, I don't think we really hold any hard feelings toward the athletic. They were very transparent uh, as the pandemic was going on um, about the situation that we were facing. And, and we knew that the writing might be on the wall. Uh, it, it sucked for the team to get gutted the way it did, but I feel like the one year that we were around, uh, we did some really good journalism and, and some good writing and, and covered some uh, topics that, you know, not everybody has the, the luxury or the, the resources to cover. And I think that's what I'm going to, uh, my biggest, I guess, regret or, or the unfortunate byproduct, byproduct of the whole thing is I really feel like we were starting to kind of find our rhythm and, and with the big fighter survey we did, I think we were, you know, tackling important topics and doing it uh, with new resources and, and new data and, and stuff we didn't have before. So I, I wish we could have finished kind of what we started. Uh, I know Ben and, and uh, Sean and, and Greg are holding down the forward back at The Athletic. Um, but, you know, it, it was definitely a bummer. It, it, 2020 has been a year of disappointments, and that was one of the big ones. And so were you part of the uh, the recruitment process? Like we, we saw all these names get announced at the same time. Were you part of the guys that were deciding who were going to bring on to the athletic? Yeah, it, it's kind of funny how it, it worked out. They they contacted me kind of out of the blue. I, I, I thought I was probably done with journalism. Uh, my wife is an optometrist. We bought an optometry practice here in Virginia, and I just planned to, to work there full time. And then the athletic called me out of the blue and said, hey, we're, we're getting ready to launch an MMA section. Uh, we need an editor. Uh, you know, a few people have recommended you, um, you know, the first thing they had me do is put together a list of writers that I would want to work with. Um, you know, they said that they already had uh, a lot of names that they were talking to that were already on the radar, but I kind of had final sign off on everybody. 
Uh, but when I gave them my list of dream writers and, and they gave me the list of people that they were already talking to that they considered the best of the best, uh, they were pretty much the same list. So we were definitely kind of uh, on the same page. And and I think, you know, like I said, it, it's easy for me, someone who's been covering MMA for a long time, uh, to identify kind of the big names who, who cover the sport. Uh, but the athletic, you know, like I said, had the same list. It, it just made it reaffirmed to me that they did their due diligence, that they they knew what they were they were getting into and, and they wanted to do it big. So um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess I, I had a hand in, in hiring uh, the initial team, but they were all folks who were already on the, the radar of the athletics. So we were in pretty good shape. How refreshing was it too, like when the athlete came along too, because like you were just saying, you know, you were kind of thinking about maybe getting out of the media for a while. Yeah, I just didn't think it would be possible to do MMA the way that I guess I wanted to do. You know, I, I'd worked for, uh, I started MMA Junkie and, and worked there for 12 years and the site had evolved many times uh, during that time. Um, I understood the need for us to go, I, I don't want to say clickbait, I never feel like MMA Junkie or or MMA fighting or bloody elbow or doing clickbait. I think, you know, it's finding that balance between original reporting and writing, uh, aggregating the best stuff that's out there and, and trying to, to take, you know, news that's maybe out there and, and putting it in a format uh, that, that serves the reader. I, I think we were doing that. I felt like we were getting a little, uh, you know, we didn't have the resources as much as I wanted for us to, to do longer form stuff, like some of the stuff that Ben Folks and Stephen Morocco were doing. Um, so I was a little bummed, uh, just kind of the direction that not just MMA Junkie, but kind of all of MMA media was heading. Um, so it, it felt like it was a good time to get out. You know, we were still just a couple of years removed from everybody pivoting the video, thinking this was going to be some big savior. And we've already seen Fox Sports going back to the, the writing. Um, so I don't know. I know this is a long-winded answer, but for me, I think that the best thing about The Athletic was that it was the promise to get to do the type of journalism and writing that I didn't think was going to be possible anymore. Um, so, the you know, I, I got to do it for a year. It, again, it sucks how it ended. Uh, but I'm really proud of what we did for that year, and it definitely kind of re-sparked interest in, in legitimate journalism um, and, and I, I, I'm thankful for that. You know, I, I, I want to stay in journalism now. You know, I'm doing some writing for the Action Network, uh, interviewing for some other full-time jobs. But I, I think the past year definitely kind of re-sparked re my my love of journalism and, and news gathering. Yeah. Well, I, I have one follow-up to that, too. Just, you know, what do you kind of make of, like, today's journalism, too? Because, like, you were talking about how it's kind of changed, but especially with a lot of these, uh, like, younger people, too, and I feel like I just remember, like, being in college and studying journalism, a lot of the professors say is, like, everyone's kind of a journalism nowadays. Everyone has a phone, everyone has access to that. So what do you kind of make of that too about like, because now I feel like there's so much quantity out there where maybe quality uh, slips under you know the door a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really where creativity and, and being unique uh, comes into play. Uh, it, it's easier now than ever for someone to, to start their own website and, and to start covering the news. And, and that's fantastic. I think the more voices we have, the better. Um, but if you really want to stand out and, and kind of be one of the big influencers uh, in the sport, uh, you've got to have something that nobody else has, you know, whether it's just the way you approach stories, a, a writing style, uh, the type of stuff that you cover. Um, you know, it, it just really puts a, you know, when, when I started MMA Junkie, I think what made the website special was that it was uh, someone doing traditional journalism, you know, the inverted pyramid and, and, and mm. keeping the bias out of it and, and trying to do what we think of old school journalism. Um, but things have evolved so much from there now. People don't want just the straight news because they can get that anywhere. Uh, I think, you know, a Junkie, The Athletic and, and the other big sites you see now, you know, Bloody Elbow and, and Fighting and, and ESPN, they, they find a, a good mix of, of news and analysis and opinion um, so I think that's always going to be kind of the, the, the future of, of sports coverage and especially MMA coverage. Uh, you may not have to be a one-stop shop, but you definitely have to offer something that you can't find at other sites. And so uh, I'm, I'm curious about a few things from especially your time with MMA Junkie, because I imagine when uh, you're the big editor at a website like that, and I guess you get to hire people and stuff, uh, things like that. How many people did you have that were messaging you, that were emailing you, wanting to join the website? And even those where you read the email, and it's like there's – 
there's no way. Like, well, what makes you think we're going to hire you at MMA Junkie? No, I mean, I, I always looked at it. You know, I, I tried to help when I when I could. I know a lot of people wanted to, you know, whether it's Junkie or The Athletic, uh, wanted to write for us. So maybe they didn't have a lot of experience, but that's a, a good opportunity uh, for me to offer, you know, just some guidance on, on where to get your feet wet and, and what to do next. Um, you know, people did that a lot for me when I was younger and, and I probably didn't uh, approach it real well or very professionally, but a few people were always super helpful and, and kind of pushed along my career. And I think, you know, I, I, I try to do that as much as I can. And I think a lot of us who have covered MMA for a long time, uh, you know, you kind of get to that point where you've been doing it five or 10 years, maybe 15 or 20, uh, some of the people, uh, and you realize the best thing you can do is kind of help the next generation. I, that's the best way to kind of leave a, I, you know, I, I don't want to get too sentimental or anything, but <laughs> if you're trying to leave, you know, I, I, I want to feel like I impacted the sport or the way we cover the sport somewhat, um, you know, and, and thankfully I've worked with a lot of writers and, and uh, you know, maybe ones like Mike Bond who were kind of, uh, you know, a little inexperienced or a little raw and, and have become kind of superstar reporters now. Uh, being able to help guide him a little bit, you know, he didn't need a whole lot of guidance, but, or, or Fernanda who worked for us at the athletic, um, you know, that was one where she always had the talent. She just didn't necessarily have the the confidence in her own writing, especially when, uh, you know, she's trying to, to write and read in a second language. Um, for me, all I had to do was kind of boost her confidence. The, the talent was already there. So, I, I don't know. I get again, a long winded answer, but you know, we've got a lot of people who have reached out to me, whether it was through Junkie or the Athletic, who want to write for us. Um, even if they're not necessarily at that level uh, or have the experience or, or the talent at that time uh, to write for a website like that, there's always ways to get your feet wet. And, and if I could help people kind of guide them in the right direction, then, uh, you know, the, 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 you get a lot of satisfaction out of that. Well, with that being said, something that uh, you, you touched on, obviously we're young in this industry. And when you have people like that that reach out to you, how do you recognize like this person truly has potential and this person might be just kind of like a glorified fan with a big opinion? Like I'm sure there's there's sort of a process to sort of figuring out which one's which and who really could use that guidance and, you know, create something for themselves. Yeah, I, I think the best thing, you know, the, the people who have engaged me the best are the ones that I feel like, oh, I, I really want to help this person. Uh, are the ones who ask good questions. If you're asking, you know, a, a potential employer, a potential editor, even a potential colleague or coworker, um, uh, you know, if you're asking them good questions, then it, it probably means when you're doing a story, you're going to ask good questions. Um, you know, the the people who hit me up, um, you know, who are like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm still new in journalism. I know I love MMA. I love writing. I, I feel like I'm pretty good at it. Um, you know, if they could recognize, like, obviously, I'm not going to jump right into working for an ESPN or, or one of these big sites, but they want to know how to get their feet wet. Um, I don't know. I, I guess it goes back to asking good questions and, and having reasonable expectations. You know, you're not going to uh, decide that you want to get into MMA journalism or work for ESPN tomorrow. Uh, but there's a lot of steps you can take to, to kind of get you to that point. And I think the ones who who are probably have a future in their career are the ones asking the right questions and hitting up the right people and, and asking for the right type of help. You know, we got a lot of people who would hit us up like, Hey, just give me a job or, Hey, can you call up Ariel and tell him I want to work for him? It's like, well, that doesn't benefit me a whole lot and what's in it for me. But also I don't think that's going to work real well if you just hit up Ariel to, to have him give you a job. So uh, I, I think the ones who, who have taken the time to kind of understand how the industry works and ask the right questions those are the ones who are going to go far. And those are ones who I have seen go far, you know, someone like for my, uh, Fernanda or Mike or some of the other people who I, I've worked with over the years. I, I just remember like being in school too. And I remember one thing that I would always hear a lot was that when you were in even just sports journalism in general, they were saying, you know, Oh, well, if you want to do MMA, like you're, you probably aren't going to get that right off the bat. You're going to have to work for like a smaller, you know, high school sports, which is like what I did for a while covering a sport you don't want to cover. But I feel like nowadays, I feel like that's, that's changed a little bit because there are so many different outlets too. Like, I mean, do you, do you agree with that, Dan? Like, I know you've been in the business for a while. Have you seen that kind of that change? Yeah, for sure. You know, when I was coming up in school, I, I, my freshman year of college was 1997, so that was a while ago. Uh, but they were still teaching us traditional journalism, the, the newsroom approach that 
you cut your teeth at a, a small weekly paper or a small daily paper and work your way up. But kind of that whole blueprint's been blown up. And, and I think it, you know, for good and bad, I, I think working for a small local paper, a, a daily or even weekly uh, newspaper, you're going to learn a lot. You're going to learn how to build sources and, and uh, just the, the, you know, the how to go about approaching reporting and, and putting a story together. But I, the positive of it is that I think it accelerates the process for the talent that, that you know, uh, someone who is going to be a top writer, they don't need to spend 10 years kind of in the minor leagues working their way up now. There's more avenues to get to the spot where you should be quicker. And I think that's good. I think, you know, a, a young hotshot writer, you know, if they're 25, uh, 25 years old, 20, 30 years ago, I don't think as many people would take you seriously until you got that, you know, small newsroom experience. But I think we realize now that the, the talent's going to rise to the top and, and now they can do it a lot more quickly. And and you'd be stupid not to, to jump on that talent and get them hired uh, just because you don't think that they, they've cut their teeth like people did 30 or 40 years ago. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, so I, I guess we'll uh, we'll take this time to kind of move on to the uh, debate portion of the show. Every week we do three different topics. Uh, this week, I mean, we, we had a lot to talk about. I mean, I feel like there was a lot going on this weekend between UFC. Uh, I know there's an LFA card uh, Friday. I watched that. And I think uh, Lux, too, was also going on. And so one thing I want to talk about is just this main event from this past weekend with Joseph Benavidez. I think a lot of people who have been covering the sport a while or even just fans of the sport – I mean, they know Benavidez's story. They, they know he's kind of been going after this for such a long time. And obviously that ends short. Now he has two losses uh, to, to Figueredo, and he says he's not retiring. So with that being said, you know, where, where does a guy like Benavidez go from here? Because I, he is kind of small for that, that bandweight division. Where do you guys see him going? And we'll start with Dan. I mean, it's a real weird situation. You know, we, we've seen it before where you're not good enough to, to win the title there's really no marketable reason to, to give you another shot, yet you don't want to retire. Um, it puts the UFC in the awkward position of, obviously Benavidez is still one of the best 125 pounders, best, you know, lighter weight fighters in the world. So you just have them knock off, you know, potential contenders and, and kind of ruining your own plans to build up contenders. I, it, it's a tough position for him. Like I said, he, he's still one of the best in the world. I think he knows he's not going to get another title shot or it's going to take a lot of magic to, to make it happen. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, like you said, he's probably a little too five for one, a little too small for 135. I don't think jumping a, a weight class is necessarily the, the perfect solution to, to situations like this. I think it definitely would make sense for a guy like Benavidez, but he's already, you know, so small for the division. And plus Bantamway's just got so many awesome fights already. You, you really don't need him there. So I don't know. I think no matter what Benavidez does, I, I think he's earned our respect and, and maybe he's not fighting, you know, the, the top two or three guys like he used to anymore. But, I, you know, I'm still entertained by watching a Joseph Benavidez fight. I, I think he's still going to fight legit dudes. Um, you know, it just it, it's tough for the UFC. Like I said, you, you can't have him knocking off your your contenders of, of uh, of the next year. So so really, what do you do with him? It, it's it's not an easy answer. Yeah. Do you think a guy like Pandoja would make sense just because he did lose to Askarov and now he kind of falls back in the rankings a little bit, but like Figueroa too, he had a recent loss to him. So he, that's a guy who I think has a name still, but you know, he, I don't think he's going to be fighting, you know, kind of it be in that mix for a little while now. Yeah. I would say if he's like a, a top two or three guy, don't put him in there, even if he's coming off a loss. But I think a guy like him where it's like, okay, it, it, it's do or die time. Either you're a contender or you're not. And now you're coming off a loss. But I think a win over a guy like Benavidez immediately puts mm-hmm. you back in the title picture. But also a, a loss to him just sets you that further back. So I think a guy like him who's not immediately knocking on the door for a title shot, that, that's actually a, a really smart matchup, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's an extremely tough spot. I mean, you're kind of in that uh, Alexander Gustafson spot, right, where you lost to DC, you lost to John Jones twice. And it's kind of like – if you don't want to move up, there's not a whole lot you can do. I mean, the problem is being at 125, you can't just say, hey, I'll go fight at Bellator because there's no 125 at Bellator. There's not a lot of uh, promotions that have 125, and we saw it when everyone got released, and pretty much no one got signed by any other promotion. So 
it really is no man's land. I mean, you have to ask yourself, if we give them guys like Pantoja, for example, can they beat Benavidez? Like, listen, are you going to squeeze the, the last out of Benavidez, add his name to, you know, these young guys' records? And it's, it's incredibly tough to do because he is still a good fighter. Uh, you know, he lost by knockout the first time to uh, Figueredo. He lost uh, this time. It, people were calling it a 10-7 round. I mean, it's, it's kind of weird to score a round that, you know, got finished. But, it, you know, he got dominated. So it, it's, a, it's a spot where you almost want to tell him, like, listen, you kind of want him to do what Uriah Faber did, right? Take that fight in Sacramento, beat a guy like Brad Pickett, and then right off into the sunset. And I think he did talk about he wanted to retire, but he wanted to retire off a win. So if you want to do that, that that's I mean that's great, especially with the right name. But it's it's an incredibly uh, tough spot. I mean, career wise, you there's no real place to go for him at this point. Yeah, I think what's like crazy about it too, though, is like yeah, he did lose back to back for real. But like if you look at like some of the wins he had like before that in this uh, win streak that got him to this spot, it's like. I, I don't think he's done yet at, at 35. Like, I, I think he still does have, like, a little bit to give as far as just, like, I mean, I'm sure that's kind of how he's feeling, as, you know, when, when you kind of forget about those back-to-back -back losses. I mean, I agree with that. But the question is, you know, you hear all these guys, like, the day I'm not fighting for the title is the day I retire. Obviously, it's all false. They're all lying because mm -hmm. none of them have retired when they've said that. But if that truly is the case for Benavidez, then you have to think about it because you're not going to be fighting for the title. So I don't think anybody's saying Benavidez isn't good enough. Obviously he is, mm -hmm. you know, he's got a win over Alex Perez, a finish who he's in talks for the title. So obviously he's good enough, but from a career perspective, does it make sense to keep him around even for what Dan was saying in the UFC, where if he's killing off these young guys, you can't, you can't have that because it's already a thin division. And if you start killing off the guys fighting for the title, you're, you're in trouble. Yeah. And we'll, we'll just uh, segue right into kind of a follow-up question that you mentioned Alex Perez and now, you know, Figueroa, you know, who, who's kind of next for him? I mean, Askarov obviously had a big one this week. I know a lot of people were talking about uh, Pantoja was going to be the guy that Figueroa didn't make weight. Maybe he would step in. And uh, you also have Brandon Moreno too. So uh, I have those three guys, which kind of seem like the front runners now. And we'll start with Dan with this one. Uh, who do you see uh, Figueroa kind of his first title defense against? I mean, I think he called for Moreno. I, I think that's a, a fun that's a fun fight. I mean, a lot of flyweight fights are fun, but any fight with Brandon uh, is going to be fun. And I think if you really want to kick off a, a title reign, uh, or at least given an opportunity to kind of, uh, you know, a win over Benavides is legit. I mean, that, that buys you instant credibility. I think now you want to follow it up with kind of a, a showstopper, something to, to really get the fans excited about you know, a possible title reign with you. Um, I, I think that fight, you know, makes a, a lot of sense. It's just, uh, it, it's tough to know, but obviously it's not going to be Benavidez for a, a third time. Um, yeah. But I, I think, you know, thankfully there, there are some options there. And, and I feel like there's always the, the threat of Henry Cejuda, you know, jumping back into the fray. I don't know if it's going to be a 125. Um, but yeah, I, I think Brandon Moreno's uh, would be a good option to, to kind of, give you the opportunity to, to really win over some fans and get them excited about your title reign. Yeah. I mean, I have to agree with that 100% Brandon Moreno. I mean, even from a rankings perspective, he's number three. I think the next guy for the title shot might be ranked number five. So even from a marketing standpoint, if you can have a three next to the name, we know the rankings don't mean anything, but pretending they do, if you have a three next to your name, it looks a lot better. He's got the big wins. Uh, he has a draw against Askar Askarov, kind of, you know, weird situations with that, but you know, at least he's not losing to the other guys that are next in line. So for me, it's a fight that makes sense. A very fun fight. Uh, also, the assassin baby, I think he's only 26. So, I mean, you know, he'll probably fight for the title again. So, for me, I think it's it's obviously it's a very fun fight. It makes sense. And if we can keep this division moving along, there's no reason these guys can't all, uh, you know, potentially fight for the title. Yeah, no, I, I think that makes a lot of sense, too. I, I was going to lean towards uh, Marino as well. Because I think you just look at, too, he has the win over Formiga. He has the win over uh, Kai Kai France, too. And then that draw against Askarov, I mean, that doesn't look so bad right now, considering the way uh, Askarov just looked, too. But, and also, I, I think one thing, too, is like you look at Perez, and I, I think he was a guy that's kind of fresh in everyone's mind because he did fight more recently and he did have a finish over uh, Formiga, too. And it was those leg kicks. So it was like, it was kind of, and I think it was on that 250 card that he still got the bonus, even when he was competing against guys like, you know, Cardi Gar Garbrandt had that knockout in that fight. Uh, Sean O'Malley as well. So he was competing with uh, some uh, you know, pretty high talent there. And I thought he stood out, but I do think Marino kind of has the better uh, just, I guess, resume so far, especially in those last, you know, three or four fights. 
And let me throw this out there too. I asked people in the media, you know, I'm seeing uh, Moreno starting to do a few interviews here and there. I'm starting to hear him talk about mm -hmm. the title shot. That's so smart. Do these interviews, get your name out there. Perez, yeah. like, you know, I haven't seen anything from him, but now's the time. Do the title shot, give you some kind of corny gimmick about, you know, I'm going to take the champion's head off. Now's the time. Like, as, as people behind the scenes, we can tell you this is a great way to drum up some interest. And uh, yeah, it'd be smart for both fighters to do a few rounds of media and get your name out there and be relevant. Yeah. Yeah, I think like Perez was kind of doing that after this last one, like very shortly, but he was like, oh, I'll step in if, you know, something happens between the Benavides for Griffa. But you're, you're right. Like we haven't heard from him in a little while now. No. But uh, with, with this next uh, debate question too, I mean, I feel like I almost kind of know the answer here because I feel like we've all kind of talked about it a little bit already. But uh, Bell, Bellator, you know, 242 coming on this weekend. Uh, I, I think it's a, a decent card and there are some, I like that there's some up and comers on there and, it is like intriguing, but as far as like that return, I you know were we expecting more? Uh, you know, was this the card? I guess from Belter we were expecting. And, you know, I kind of I don't want to say post pandemic because the pandemic's still going on, but their first card back during the pandemic. Uh, what do you think, Dan? Yeah, I mean, I think we would have expected something a, a little flashier, a little more, uh, uh, you know, stacked. I, I think the the most troubling thing the past few months is how. I, I don't want to speak on behalf of you guys or everybody, but I think a lot of us just kind of completely forgot about Bellator. You know, it, it, we talk about MMA making a return, and that's just synonymous with the UFC. Um, like I said, it's a it's a small sport. I think the people who who follow the sport are really into it, probably bigger fans than uh, people would be for from other sports. But it's still a small sport, and. There, there's just not a whole a whole lot of room for a, a number two in a sport that small. Um, you know, it would have been awesome if they really came out with kind of guns blazing and a, a huge stack card. Um, I mean, I'm like I said, I'm really excited about that that Chandler Benson Henderson mm -hmm. fight. I, I think that could have been one to make a splash, but also still with so many unknowns. I think maybe they just kind of want to get a show under their belt to, to prove that they can do it, and then maybe some of the bigger cards will start coming together. But yeah, I mean, like I said, the past few months, I, I think that, that if you're Bellator, the most disappointing thing has to be that lack of, of uh, demand for Bellator to come back and, and people can't live with Bellator. Uh, so they got a little work to do when they got back. But, you know, they get a, a couple big events, a couple big fights, uh, you know, a, a, a big, you know, a, a scrappy fight that, that goes viral. Uh, they're right back in the conversation, but they got a little work to do right now. Yeah. Yeah, because me and Lucas were kind of talking about this. Like, maybe it was like, I, it was it two shows ago? Maybe even three shows ago. We were kind of talking about uh, with with Belter and everything. How we we kind of thought maybe that they should. We thought like, we you know, why aren't they trying to push this maybe to come back sooner? Because like during that time, there wasn't like a lot of platforms. Obviously, the UFC's been going since May 9th. but still, like we just thought maybe that was like a platform that if they want to get a name out there to maybe grab some more attention, some some of those fans that aren't aren't uh, tuning in every week to to watch their shows. Maybe, maybe that would be a chance. So I don't think it's like a bad card either, but it, it's just not uh, quite what I was expecting. How about you, Lucas? Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit disappointing. I kind of thought they were going to come back, and I saw Chandler versus Henderson get thrown out there, and I was like, oh, great. And then it's like, no, not this card. It's like, ah, okay. It, it, it was kind of seemed like a short notice. I talked to uh, Rofi and Stotts about, you know, when did you find out about this? And it, what it sounds like is Bellator told these guys, listen, you're fighting, so just be ready. But they didn't tell them you're fighting this guy and that guy. So I imagine if you hit up a guy like Michael Chandler, like, hey, man, you're fighting, just we'll tell you the week of the fight. That's not flying. Uh, it definitely is a great point by Dan. It does feel like a little bit of a test run, right? Like, can we go out there? Can we do the right tests and stuff? And maybe not, I guess you can say, sacrifice some of our bigger <laughs> talents. But it, this is the kind of card where casual fans, there's really nothing for you. Like, if, even if you look at the main event, like, okay, uh, you can look at Bandejas and maybe remember him because he beat Connor's loudmouth training partner. And then you look at Sergio Pettis and you're like, I recognize that name Pettis, but the guy doesn't look quite right. I'm not sure what it is. And, well, that's that's because it's, it's a little brother. shorter. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like it, it, it looks like him, but something's not right. It's like, no, something's not right. But it, it's the kind of card that if you look through it, you can find little gems. Like I mentioned, Stotts and stuff like that. There are a few fights you can look at. Like, that could be fun. We don't want fun. Like you saw the UFC came back. I'm trying to think their first show was – was it a uh, Ferguson versus Gaethje? Like, you know, you compare that to what Bellator are doing and, mm -hmm. you, you know, it's just not the same thing. So for sure it's disappointing. Uh, you know, I hope they can come back stronger. I mean, this is really the kind of card where you have to try to find the gems and that's just not how you're going to get casual fans. And, 
you know, and Bellator, I know it suffers with the casual fans. I brought, I invited a friend over last summer. I was like, you want to come watch some fights? Yeah. And we're watching and he's like, so what is this? Like, you know, the amateurs, like an amateur show or something. I'm like, I'm like, man, this is like number two behind UFC. Like, you know, these guys are legit. All right, man, if you say so. Like, I think they suffer from the, uh, the, the production standpoint. I think the UFC looks so good, so professional. And I'm curious with no crowd, is that going to hurt Bellator even more? But yeah, the, it's, it's just disappointing of a show, but you know, if they can make up for it with some great cards in the future, then I mean, you know, we're going to forget about it by the time the card's over. So, you know, I'm not too worried about that. Yeah. Cause yeah, like I, I don't hate that fight between Pass and Day House, but as far as like just being that, like, I mean, event was just kind of like, yeah. surprising. But it's interesting too, because like I, I interviewed uh, the Day House too. And like he said, yeah, he was like, he's like, I didn't even know it was like a main event until he's like, they kind of just brought it up like last minute. Like he said that. <laughs> What he what his plan was was he's like he's like I'm always the guy who's like in my manager's ear. He's like I was actually gonna be like, hey, I'm just gonna take it easy. And, you know, I'm in Florida where you know that's not the greatest spot to be right now with like COVID and everything. So he would just kind of sit back, relax, and then his manager called him and was like, hey, main event, Pettis, and he was like, well, I can't say no. <laughs> so then he kind of just went, and I talked to Jason Jackson yesterday, and Jason Jackson didn't even know he was in the co-main event. He saw like a post on Instagram and was like, oh, sweet. Like I'm in the co <laughs> event. Like, so it's like, I couldn't believe that. Like I had to ask him. I was like, you didn't know that? He was like, no. He's like, you're just kind of. So I definitely agree, Lucas, when you say, I think it was definitely last minute, <laughs> which is yeah. maybe that's why we didn't get. And I like, I give Bellator a little credit too, because I know they were trying to get a title fight on there between Mix yeah. and Archuleta. But even then, I don't know how much greater that, how much excitement that gives me compared to like what I already have for this card. But um, anyways, moving on, back to the UFC. Uh, one thing I just thought was interesting, uh, I feel like a lot of people are talking about this too, but with Dana White's comments about Aljamain Sterling. Now, I think he said, you know, uh, he's in there, he, he's up there, he's one of them, but wasn't really uh, specific on if Aljamain's going to be that guy. So my question to you guys is, it, can you make a case? Well, I mean, I guess you can make a case for anybody, but is, is there anyone more deserving? Than Aljamain right now to, to be that next uh, title shot contender, and we'll start with Dan on this one. I mean, I, I I don't know if there's anyone more deserving. I think Aljamain is definitely deserving. I, you know, there it may there would be no reason not to give him a title shot unless you had a, a clear cut another option. And, and the fact that the UFC and, and Dana aren't giving an answer beyond just he's in the mix, it may be him. I mean, it, it kind of forces you to draw your own conclusions, and, and that's never a good thing because fans aren't going to give you the benefit of the doubt. You know, it, it, you can look at Sterling and be like, well, do they just not get along? Is it his fight style? Is it his race? Obviously, I don't think it's a, a matter of that. But yeah. a, a, again, when you're not giving a definitive answer and it seems to make perfect sense otherwise, uh, uh, you're, you're leaving it on the fans to draw their own conclusions, and that's never a good thing. <laughs> It's weird because I thought we all agreed that the fight against Sanhagen, like that was the number one contender fight. And then, mm -hmm. uh, you know, things get weird. I was talking to Marlon Marais a few days ago and, you know, he was basically saying he deserved the next title fight. He, he was like, nobody will take a fight with me. So therefore I should get the title. And, you know, I was trying, you know, I was trying to be like, you know, what, what do you think about Aljamain Sterling? Like, you know, what about him getting the next title shot? And, you know, he was kind of brushing that off. So I'm wondering if it's, you know, it's specifically maybe they don't want Aljamain Sterling to get the shot or if a well-known manager is doing the right kind of push to get his client to potentially be out there. It's a, it's a very tough situation. For me, it was clear that it was Aljamain Sterling and it would have been nice to just see him, you know, even instead of Aldo throwing Aljamain, like you have a little bit of a log jam that you could have cleared up instead of Aldo. So uh, it, it's a very weird situation. Um, we're hearing rumbles of, uh, right, like they're trying to get a new contract and stuff like that. And I remember 2015, now Jermaine Sterling was a free agent and he he made him work for that new UFC contract. So uh, I'm curious, could it be a contract thing? But uh, uh, it obviously sounds to me like a negotiation tactic, right? Like, does he get the next title fight? And, you know, oh, we'll see that, you know, that way you can't use it against them. But it's a very unfortunate situation. Yeah, I think look, one thing I think is also like baffling, too, is when at, right after Cejudo had retired in that press conference, White was like, it's Jan and someone else. So he, he knew it was Jan, like right of like right off the bat, which I think is crazy because now it's like you look at this, and I feel like things are a lot more clear than they were at that time. And yet, like a guy like Aljamain, which it seems like he's the clear choice, isn't in in in, in White's eyes, which uh, I think is pretty interesting. Because I've also seen some people kind of argue that they're like, well, uh, he lost to Marias, 
That that loss to Marais was like I think it was like 2017, and he's won yeah. f- I think what five fights since then. So it's like I, I don't think you can hold that uh, against Aljamain Sterling anymore. I think the other thing too, like you don't want to delay these guys so long before they get their title shot that you feel like you're not getting the best version of them. You know, the more miles you're putting on these guys, and especially like a guy like Sterling, if he does end up winning the title. And then he's trying to defend it, you know, having him just, you know, fight these contender fights after contender fight. Uh, I think a lot of them probably have been or would be five round fights. I mean, it's just a lot of wear and tear to put on somebody before they even get the the shot at the title mm-hmm. so that once they have it, then you're not seeing the best version of them. And, and that's just kind of, I mean, it, it's good and bad. I mean, it's just a byproduct of that division being so, so stacked, but it's also a shame that we just can't get any clarity on that one specific guy. Yeah, because I know now you're seeing like Garbrandt's like he's putting his name out there too, which I mean I don't think he's. Or, I mean I know he just won no. what, what, one out of the last four fights, but but yeah, but that's the thing though is like he has that name, so like I mean I I don't think he should be, and I don't think he should be in contention, but like I I like I would not be shocked. Yeah, is what I'm saying. And Marash brought up that you know T.J. Dillashaw is coming back. So it, that's going to make it a little bit weirder too. So, you know, it, it's one of those things that you really just want to see him move along with these contenders. I feel like ever since Connor wanted the two belts, like every division is like so slow to happen. Like it was nice when you could see guys defend the title three times a year and go on these long reigns. Like, man, it, it, honestly, it frustrates me. Like you see a title fight happen. It's like, all right, guess we'll see you next year. Yeah. Well, everyone's already talking about Figueredo too. They're like, oh, well, he could bump up too. Like, yeah, it's like, come on. <laughs> So it's like, yeah. I mean, it's like, are you missing contenders? Like, are you not entertained? You're not happy with who you have? Seriously? <laughs> so uh, we did this last week, and I, I thought we would do this uh, this week too, kind of do a bonus topic here. And this kind of just happened uh, recently. So uh, with Joanne Calderwood, I mean, I was just shocked by this. She ends up taking a short nose fight against uh, Jennifer Maya, UFC on ESPN plus uh, 31, August 1st. But Calderwood, you know, everyone thought she was going to fight uh, Shevchenko next. Is this a good move for, for Calderwood? And we'll start with Dan again. <laughs> I mean, I guess it, it depends on what they're telling her and, and, and what could go you know, what could happen based off this. But I mean, if I'm in her shoes, I'm probably very tempted to to sit and wait and, and, and try to get the title shot. But, you know, it, it, as guys like Ster- Aljamain Sterling have seen, you know, sitting around waiting sometimes, you just get pushed further and further back in the queue. So, I don't know. Like I, I, I appreciate the the toughness, um, but yeah, th- there's a lot for her to to lose on this fight with probably not a whole lot to gain. Yeah, it's a very weird situation. I mean, imagine she goes out there and in the first round she just gets starched like a big overhand that we never see in that division comes out of nowhere and it's just it's over. It's unfortunate, but I imagine it's got to be something behind the scenes, right? Like maybe there's some kind of incentive money wise. Maybe there's promises being made. Like even if you lose, maybe just one more fight will get you out there. I, I'm not sure what it is. I know there's a big focus for her because I tried reaching out for an interview and they're like, look, it's too close to the fight. I'm like, really? Because, you know, it's too close to, I, I asked you the day the fight was announced. So that hard <laughs> to that, you know, like the fight ha- is very close to them anyway. So it's a, uh, it's an interesting situation, but I'm sure she saw something in that fight where, you know what, I obviously she thinks she can win it and maybe do something that would be worthy of, I don't know, making your name bigger or something, but obviously her and her team see something in that fight that maybe the rest of us aren't quite seeing. Yeah. All right. And then, I mean, let's just uh, play kind of just off of that real quick, uh, just a fob to, I mean, if she does lose to, to Maya, who, who, who would you put uh, in that title shot next then? Okay. Anyone wants to go first? <laughs> I, was going to say. Uh, I, th- I think you'd have to tell us some of those contenders. I think off the top of my head, it's uh, it's it's a little bit tough for that one. All right. Yeah, I was going to say I, I would have to pull up the rankings to, yeah. to really know what that. She's just been so dominant as champion that you kind of forget about everybody else. Oh, Lauren there. Murphy. You know what? I think Lauren Murphy oh, would yeah. be a good one. Yes. She's got she's got a good streak going. I saw some fans were talking to her about it, but. I think she's one of those fighters that's very like aware, like, oh, maybe I'll just take another fight, whatever. But I think Lauren Murphy could be a good one. She's got a good streak going. Mata Ferry was a good fight. So I think I'll go with uh, Lauren Murphy without looking at the rankings. But that would seem to me like a pretty good one. I think it'd serve as a good reminder, too, that sometimes if you just put in the work and get the wins, eventually your shot's going to come. And I think someone like Lauren Murphy is going to be 
she's going to be a, a, dog, a, a live dog in any fight. You know, yeah. you mm-hmm. can't really count her out. Just that the toughness, the, the veteran savvy, just the, the grit. Like, yeah, no, I think that's a, a really good idea. Yeah. Uh, very impressive, Lucas. We're right, right off the top of the dome there. That was good. That was good. <laughs> I mean, well, so that's it for the uh, the topics this week. Uh, that concludes our, our fifth episode. Uh, Dan, uh, before we let you go, uh, a- anything you'd like to say? No, you can follow me on Twitter. That's where I post kind of everything that uh, I'm up to and, and doing some pics for the Action Network. So just D-A-N-N-S-T-U-P-P on Twitter, Dan Stop. All right. And then, guys, you can follow us on our Instagram and Facebook, Deep Water MMA Podcast. And our Twitter is uh, at MMA underscore deep. And then my personal Twitter is at CNorthup732. Uh, Lucas? Yeah, so you can follow me Twitter and Instagram <laughs> at Grand Sire MMA. Grand Sire, it's written down here somewhere. I know it's complicated just hearing it like that. Please subscribe on YouTube like that. If you look at it like, oh, should I subscribe? Please, damn it. Uh, subscribe on YouTube. If you watch this and you run an MMA site and you have the budget, hire me. And uh, yeah, some some content is coming out there, interviews with Jack Romance and stuff like that. So uh, good stuff to look forward to. All right, cool. Yeah, and uh, follow my stuff too on YouTube. <laughs> Much shorter. Uh, thanks again, Dan, for, for joining us. Uh, thanks, everyone, for watching. Uh, next week's guest, uh, <laughs> I don't think we have a decide yet, but I mean, we've been uh, kind of rolling through these. So I mean, it, it, it's been great. It's, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, and thanks to my main news for kind of letting this happen. Eric Olwell, uh, very appreciative to him. And yeah, Bellator 242 Friday, UFC this Saturday. Again, the last of the Fight Island cards. Uh, it's gone by fast. Uh, thanks for watching, guys, and we'll see you next week. All right. Great. <laughs>